Hi, I'm George Dory, and welcome to our Coast to Coast AM YouTube channel. Have fun, tell your friends, and share us with everyone. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and Coast to Coast AM's mobile app. And always remember to log on to our website at coasttocoastam.com for daily articles, the best paranormal information, and all you need to know about your favorite guests. And now you can become a Coast Insider directly through the Coast mobile app. We welcome our international listeners and even offer a free two-week trial. So don't delay. Become an insider today. And welcome back to Coast to Coast. George Norrie back with director, writer, author Rich Martini beginning his examination of the afterlife after experiencing frequent visits visits from his partner after passing. Rich decided to film people under hypnosis to try and find a deeper understanding of death and dying. Put together several videos including Hacking the Afterlife film, Flipside, A Journey into the Afterlife, and then a number of books including Hacking the Afterlife And his latest work here, Divine Counsels in the Afterlife, The Flipside Court. Rich, welcome back, my friend. Always great to have you. Always great to hear your voice, George. What a treat. Uh, You were just mentioning how uh, I've been doing this thing where, you know, filming people under hypnosis. And I kind of thought, wouldn't it be interesting if I filmed a bunch of people not under hypnosis to see Mm -hmm. what the, you know, and especially what about people who've never heard of me, don't know anything about the flip side don't know anything about councils or guides or any of that stuff. And I thought, well, that might be an unusual experiment. And I had a friend help me set that up. So we had a group of people from around the world, scientists, a couple of uh, – one scientist from Harvard, Akira Wirasakira, who is one of the winners of the Bigelow Prize. I know you interviewed the top winner. Yes. Uh, you know, the afterlife story. But, um, and he's allowed me to use his name – um, which was wonderful because, you know, a lot of times I have people uh, do these things anonymously because they don't, they oh, don't yeah. want people to know that they can, you know, talk to people on the flip side. But in his case, because he's a scientist, he really felt it was important that we do this kind of work. And so the idea was I was going to try to access, see if people could access a guide, see if people could access a council, their divine council is the term that people use, <clears throat> excuse me, and that, that term has been used for centuries in every major religion. You know, uh, the book of Job talks about God's council. Every, the Celtic myths, you know, pretty much everybody has a council. Everybody's had a council throughout history. We just always have assumed it was one particular council, but apparently, and based on this research, Everyone has their own counsel. And by the way, you mentioned uh, Dr. Jeffrey Mishlov was the winner of the Bigelow contest. He won a half a million dollars, Rich. I know. It's amazing. And, uh, well, Akila was, Dr. Akila was one of the other winners. You know, they had research winners. And he going to help yeah. me in my next project, actually, when we submit to uh, the Bigelow for this round. And we'll see how that goes because well, I'm going to use his expertise help me with it so let's let's talk about divine councils yes so the idea is would it be possible to take people who've never done hypnosis and just have a conversation with them and that's what i did basically i had uh, a friend of mine organized her group who does they've done guided meditation on a sort of a professional basis they've all done that around the world they've gone to conferences and, you know, guided meditation is really just saying to someone, relax, and let's imagine ourselves somewhere. And what I picked for our, my experiment was the Beatles song, Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds, huh. where they say, picture Bless yourself on, in a boat on a river. And what I would suggest people do, and your listeners, hopefully, if you're not driving, but um, where you just picture yourself in a boat – on a river, it's very simple, and you see yourself in some kind of a boat. People might say it's made out of wood. People might say it's made out of plastic or whatever that is they use, you know, in, in fishing boats. They'll say, they'll describe what it looks like size-wise, and then I'll say, what's the river look like or the body of water? Sometimes they see themselves on a lake or sometimes it's a river. and Sometimes they see flora and fauna on the shore. And by being specific, I then go from that kind of 
etheric idea into something uh, visual like I asked them to bring a guide forward. And the guide, everyone's guide, knows what I'm doing. They know why I'm asking these questions. The person might not, and they'll say, well, I don't really see anybody, or I see an individual, and I tell them, you know, ask them to bring forward somebody that's male or female or a light. And sometimes it's a light. So a little bit hard to converse with a light, so I'll ask if the, their guide can manifest as a person. And then it gets interesting because they'll say, oh, this is interesting. I'm seeing so-and-so, my great-grandfather or somebody they've known. And then, I'll, then I ask, is it possible for me to ask the guide direct questions? And if somebody says I'm not, get, I'm not getting anything, I'll say, well, ask them to nod, shrug, or shake their head, which is a visual answer, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know. And so that idea of you can have a conversation with someone just by saying, you know, yes, no, or, or, or I don't know. And sometimes they don't answer, and I take that to mean they're not sure of who I am or what I'm doing. And so that's always the next question I ask. I ask the guide, are you familiar with what I'm doing? Do you know me? And sometimes the person that I'm talking to has never met me, doesn't know anything about me, but they'll say, well, my guide is saying, oh, yeah, you're the guy who asks annoying questions. <laughs> and in one case, one guy said, yeah, you're the troublemaker. <laughs> and I was like, what? What does that mean? And then I say, is it all right if we go to visit their council? Now, the person, uh, uh, Dr. Drew, when I did a session with him, he said, what's a council? And I said, well, I'm, I wasn't asking you, Drew. I was asking your guide. And they'll say, no, I don't think it's time for them to go, usually. I mean, sometimes they'll say that. Or they'll say, sure. And this person then describes either being in a building or being outside. Or sometimes they're outside in the outer space, and they sort of see other people around them. And sometimes they'll see a lot of people. 40, 50 people, let's say, in a, a cathedral. And then I'll say, well, do you have a core group of people that sort of watch over your lifetime? Can we talk to them? And usually they'll say anywhere from 3 to 12, sometimes 15 people. And I'll ask them to describe uh, how they're sitting. Are they standing? Are they in a chair? Or... And they'll describe that. And, and then I say, let's go to the person on the far left, and let's ask them some questions. And I try to be as polite as I can to let them know, these people in the council, that I'm not there to disrupt this person's journey or path. Um, and then I just ask really straightforward questions. What do you see? Who are you? Do you sit on any, any other councils? Are you familiar with my work? Those types of questions. And the idea of asking the same questions to different council members allows us to get objective results from subjective experiences, something that Dr. Grayson mentioned in his book after when he does his near-death experience studies. You know, all these people have a near-death experience, and then you could argue, well, it's subjective because it just happened to this one person. But if you ask 100 people the same questions, you get data. So I go through each council member and I ask them, uh, how did you get on this person's council? How long have you been on the council? Do you serve on any other councils? Do you have a council? Do you have a guide? And what's so fascinating, George, is that when people start to visualize, again, they're not under hypnosis, they're seeing these wise beings that have been with them for all of their lifetimes. Sometimes they're people who normally don't incarnate on Earth. Let me say that again. Mm -hmm. They're people that appear to be aliens. Let's call it that. There's no other term we have for that. But, you know, somebody, classic terms that they have for these individuals, but that's what they're seeing. And sometimes it's disturbing to the person who's seeing that. Of course, sure. You know, they'll say, oh, my God, this is weird. There's like a tall insect in front of me. Let's just, one guy said that. And I say, well, let's go over and ask, can we ask questions? And... Uh, I say, can you put your hand in your mind's eye in this person's hand or whatever that is that they have in front of them? And then I ask the emotion or feeling that they get from doing so. And it's always, almost always, a feeling of familiarity, 
of home of sometimes unconditional love, like this person loves me beyond measure because they know me. And then I'll ask this strange-looking individual, has this person ever incarnated, the person I'm talking to, have they ever incarnated on the place that you normally incarnate from, you see? So I'm asking, you know, uh, somebody I've never met before on a council who looks like a particular being, and of course, when I say looks like, that's what they're emanating as a frequency or a visual. But I'll ask them, um, has my friend here ever incarnated with you on your planet? And almost always, they say yes. And then I'll say, well, can you show that to this person? And the person I'm talking to says, with some degree of shock or surprise, oh, wow, I'm seeing this planet. I'm seeing these, you know, these other individuals. And I do this continual questions, you know, who are these people? And, you know, I try to get to the bottom line. So what are you doing here? Or why is this person here on this planet if they normally incarnate on your planet? And I'm happy to say no one said it's a cookbook, you know, the Twilight Zone. Exactly. To serve man. Yeah, they to serve man. They don't say that. What they do say is it is to help humanity. It is to help people to communicate etherically or telepathically. Because that will help people on the planet to realize they're not alone, to realize that they have guides and teachers watching over them, to realize that there are other people from other planets. I mean, over 35% of the people at the Newton Institute report uh, memories of lifetimes off planet. And I I just heard the other day that they've had 65,000 reports so far. So over 35% of those reports at the Newton Institute include people remembering lifetimes in other areas, in other realms, in other, and let's just say other planets, not just one or two, just they're all over the place. So my point is, you know, here we have the government spending millions of dollars trying to figure out what UFOs are. Well, why not just talk directly to people who've actually remembered being, having lifetimes on those planets? You should show everybody how to do this. Well, yes, it's, and it's very – look, I'm, I'm trying to make it as simple as I possibly can, which is picture yourself in a boat on a river. That's the first thing to allow your mind to see something that's not in front of you. You're bypassing the filters, let's just say. The, and these, the these are non-hypnotized people, right? Non-hypnotized people. And that is, by the way, why uh, Dr. Akila – we're, we're – I can't pronounce his last name, where where Sakara reached out to me because he's been studying filters on the brain. They're mentioned in Dr. Grayson's book after. He's got a chapter on them. But it appears that humans have these filters on the brain that block information not conducive to survival, which includes consciousness outside the brain and includes memories of previous life and includes all these different things that to just normal path of a human is to not remember that stuff. And it's and I, I'm fond of saying everyone's a medium. They just have filters that block that stuff. Now, some children, as you know, up until about the age of eight, some children don't have those filters. And they see grandma, they see grandpa, they right. see, or they remember previous lifetimes. And in Dr. Grayson's work, he notes how in dementia patients, just prior to passing, it's like the filters have died because the their brains have atrophied. But they are seeing grandma. They are recalling previous lifetimes. They're saying things like, I'll be your father again in another lifetime. So the filters are the key in terms of this research. And what in terms of hypnotherapy, mediumship, and this version, guided meditation, I'm offering people the chance to bypass those filters in the simplest form, which is to say, look, I know you have a guide, and I know your guide's watching out for you, and I know your guide wants to help you. I know your guide doesn't want me to interfere with your chosen path, whatever that is, so I'm not going to ask you any questions that are going to interfere with your path, but I will ask you questions that will help you with your path. And, you know, I've had some council members push back, I must say, just to be honest, 
to say, well, not everybody's ready to hear this sort of thing. And the argument that I get into with them is to say, well, it's like your audience right now, George. There's people out there saying, well, that can't be. This is not possible. There's no way. This guy's talking through his hat. He's Joe Hollywood. Like, why doesn't everybody know this? Why isn't this mainstream science? People are going to push back on that, and that's a good thing because that's going to block them from hearing this information because it would change their path. They would stop fearing things. They would realize that Aunt Betty and Uncle Pete are still available to converse with them, still available to tell them things about their journey. Or, you know, they can't disrupt us. They can't say, you know, here's the lottery numbers. They just, that would change our path because we've chosen our path. That's the key. But they can't help us because they're amused by us. They still love us. They can still give us advice. So the same thing goes with divine count, let God, with council members. Let's just call them that. There's no spirituality really involved with what I'm talking about. This is these are just, you know, I mean, of course, all religions talk about them as if they're avatars or deities, et cetera, et cetera, which is fine. But I'm saying, well, who are they? Well, and you know? what's what's the purpose of the councils? So the purpose of the councils. It's like having, uh, you know, when you when you study to be um, a doctoral candidate, you have a thesis panel that you have to go through. And that thesis panel, there are people who have looked at all your work. They're the parole board. They're the parole board. They've, mm-hmm. they've decided what kind of journey that you've been on. You remember that film, Defending Your Life with Albert Brooks? Mm-hmm. You know, he had mm-hmm. that whole story of, of having these sort of judges telling you whether you're not going to get from one place to the next. Well, those people really help you. It's, you know, it's almost like a documentary, that film. People do help you get from one place to the next. So you want to graduate from whatever this journey is that you're on? You want to get to the next level? You have to go through these parameters. And you have these wise teachers who help you. They're not judging you. You could call it judging, right? Because your teacher gives you an F. That's definitely a judgment call. But they, but they don't give Fs. They kind of they they nudge you and say, you know, you might come back. So every every person has two trips to the the council. One is the preview of what your life is going to be because you tell them, here's what I'm planning on doing. You're arguing with the doctoral thesis committee. This is what I want to do. I want to. I'm going to be born in Missouri, and then I'm going to do a. I'm going to do this talk show. I'm going to help people all over the world because they're going to realize that life goes on. And now you get to the end of that journey, and now you have the post view. So it's almost like the way soldiers, uh, the bomber pilots, used to come back from World War II, and they'd say, "Well, here's how the mission went." This is so how you it go happened. and see the council, and you say, "Look, guys, here's what I learned." Now you might argue, "I've mastered that." You see how good I was? I was fantastic. I donated money to people. I was helped. And the guide, your your council member, might say, "Well, wait a second. Who did you help? Who did you really help?" And then you say, well, aren't you listening to me? I, but they I, already I, know, don't they, Rich? They already know, and that's why they're pointing it out to you. Because they, and, and this happened in Michael Newton's work where he mentioned how a guy was there talking to his counsel and saying, you know, I was very generous. I gave all my money away. Who picks the counsel, Rich? Um, I, just to finish up that story about Michael Newton, it was just that uh, the, the, the thing that he recounted was somebody – Seeing their counsel, felt that he had been a very generous person in life, and they asked him, who did you help? And then they showed him um, a woman that was crying on a bus, and he, this guy had put his arm around her and said, everything's going to be okay. And then they showed him how that one act of kindness reverberated out through the universe, through her universe, her family, and everything. So the council members themselves, they, it, it, they grow in number. So every lifetime that you've learned something very difficult, because I'll ask the council members, what do you represent in this person council? And they'll say, let's say, courage. And then I'll say, well, did they earn your presence on their council through a difficult lifetime, something they had to do that was courageous? And they'll say, yes. And then I'll say, well, can you show that to them? And then suddenly the person's saying, okay, it's the Renaissance, and I'm in the midst of this battle, and I sacrifice myself for my comrades. And that was when that person became their council member. And so it's like 
the amount could be anywhere from, like from three to fifteen, but the numbers grow. The other thing is, when doing this kind of work, you can get to a council and they'll say, "Well, I'm seeing twelve chairs, but there's only six people here," and I'll ask about that, and they'll say, "Well, the hmm. I'm, are they are they busy? <laughs> are they playing golf? You know, what are they doing?" <laughs> yeah, really. And they'll say, "Well, it's because." If this person saw this individual now, it would disrupt their path. So it's like they don't show up for these meetings, you know, having this conversation. And then I also ask the question, because like I said, generally councils get visited by the person that, you know, they're watching over twice for each lifetime. And then here I am in the middle of their lifetime bringing them back, you know, and asking questions to them to show them that we're always connected to our council members. Then I'll ask, you know, is this okay? I mean, that we're we're disrupting them. And they'll say, no, it's him. And I've heard this. It's not me talking. I've heard this from other people saying it's important for humanity, that people need to hear this, that we're always connected to them. We're tethered to them. So when they feel alone and lost and lonely, all they have to do is ask for our help. Again, they can't intercede because we did sign up for a lifetime, but they can help us access whatever it is we need to access, whether it's, whether it's you know, a person before they go gambling in Vegas to say, you know, help me win, help me be successful. It, the, the same thing can happen when it comes to going to a job interview. Ask your guides, ask your, these council members to give you support and insight and sometimes before you go to sleep, you can ask, ask them to come forward and say, "Look, I just I need some help with this thing. And can you do it? Can you do it in a non-invasive way, so I'm not terrified when I, you know, see whoever it is." Do they quietly make things happen, Rich? Apparently so, and that apparently coincident, you know. And then how do you make things happen? Well, people will report, you know, Jennifer and I, Jennifer Schaefer and I have been doing this for a while. We have the podcast, Hacking the Afterlife, and every week right. we talk to people on the flip side. And I always ask about process. How did you make that happen? How did you get that quarter to appear in front of my friend? And how did you put that piece of jewelry in their path? And they talk about a couple of things. One is they're outside of time. So it's not hard for them to see all the parameters that are involved to get that song to play on the radio at the exact time you're driving by your friend's house who passed away so that you remember your friend. They talk about coincidence, about creating visuals for you. It's much easier than creating dialogue and sound. You need air to create sound. But you can put a thought in people's minds. You can put a thought in someone's mind when they're dreaming. Much easier because their filters are down. So that idea of bypassing, they're, they're bypassing your filters, and we're bypassing our filters in order to make this connection. So, you know, you've heard that thing of 1111, you know, and people talk about it mm -hmm. all the time as if it's some kind of magical. Right. But I have, I've asked the question, so what's up with 1111? What was that about? And what I've gotten from them is the idea that it's a physical manifestation, a visualization of what's going on. They're on one side of a fence. Think of 11 as a fence, and or the, the, the colon in between. And they're on one side of the hall, and we're on the other side of the hall. They need to slow down because their frequency is so much exponentially different than ours. They need to slow down in order to pass messages, ideas, thoughts, nudges to us for us we need to speed up so what how does that work meditation could be a relaxation could be just being in a happy place so you can accept it one more key is being open to the possibility that a person still exists if you're not open to that possibility then it's like locking the gate because they come up and they, they're trying to communicate with you. If you don't believe it's possible, then you will never hear from them. But if it's possible on some level that they could communicate, that appear, apparently is the key to open up the door so that they can show up in a song, show up in a visual memory. Sometimes people have cigar smoke while I'm talking to them, doing one of these guided meditations, and they suddenly are overcome with tears because they're saying, oh, my gosh, this is, I can smell the pipe smoke of my professor. 
you know, I haven't smelled it since they passed away, and it's in my face right now. So those kind of things, they can let us know viscerally that they exist, that even though we might not consciously know who they are, we can bypass those filters to access them, to learn new information from them. Are these council members people we have known in their lives before they died or are not? Sometimes, yes. And, and that's it's fascinating because it's, a lot of times people will say, oh, I'm seeing an older person. He's a very ancient looking. I ask them to describe the, him or her, and they'll say, you know, white hair or white robes or et cetera. But sometimes, like I said, council members could be a, a young person. They see like a young, like one, uh, somebody that I, is in the book saw a, per, a girl, like a young girl, like on a bicycle. And, and it was like so young. But I, so I asked her, what do you represent in this person's thing? And it was the joy of the new. That's what she said, finding something new. And she had had a number of lifetimes on Earth. And most recently, I don't know how many years ago, I forget, but she said that was the thing. She represented something about the joy of the new, and that was important for this guy who's a screenwriter, and and she's helping him with that, to always remember what it was like to find something fresh and new in his work. So it it, it really depends, and sometimes people see uh, relatives, some like a great-grandfather, or, and, and I'll ask that person, are you, are you this person's great-grandfather? Are you just visually giving them something that's comfortable to remember? And sometimes they'll say it's the comfortable thing. They're just giving them somebody that looks like their grandfather so they can have a conversation. One of the most interesting is in the book where um, there's a, a podcaster out of England, Simon Bone, who we did a very long session where at some point he's talking to his council member and he comes upon like a tough guy, almost like a Fonzarelli, you know, leather jacket, yeah, smoking yeah. a cigarette. Every one of his answers was oh, snarky. And uh, Simon from Cambridge, this, this council member was in the Vietnam War and was from San Diego. And he had all the references that somebody from, you know, SoCal would have what he was talking about. And at some point, I, I was, he was being very uh, taciturn with me and, and like a tough guy. Like, what are you asking that for? And I said, um, what do you look like to the other council members? And he paused and said, okay, you got me. I look like a light. That's what I look like. So in other words, he was presenting this tough guy with a leather jacket, smoking mm-hmm. a cigarette, to this Simon. And, to, you know, so that – and one of the other council members says, oh, that's just Frank. That's just what, what he that, does. That, that's who he is, right? That's who he is, you know. But to, to them, he is a light. He's an energetic light, and then they manifest. As an individual, as a person, as a you know older person, as a whatever that is, whatever they prefer to manifest as, and it's almost like an agreement between us and them. We see them as this person that's wise, and they see us as their sort of student who's learning. It's a fascinating look at uh, at how to figure out why we're on the planet. Are they guiding us while we're alive, or are they trying to help us once we die? Well, there's two answers to that. One is uh, they're totally trying to help us while we're here. They're always, they they want to say that. They've always got our back. Because I'll ask. Are they like know, guardian angels, Rich? Like guardian, absolutely like guardian angels. Because I'll ask, you know, is is there ever a moment in time where you guys are so busy running around doing something else that you forget us? And I laughed laughter. And they'll say, no, we're tethered. Literally, while you're doing something and you're focused on something, we're aware of it. And we, again, they can't interfere, but they can support. So it's that thing of saying, you know, and you start to think about, well, are, is, this, is this the same thing as creativity? Like when I'm thinking of something and I'm trying to be creative and I'm trying to well, it appears to be something similar to that, which is you're opening up the field to get an idea, an image, a sound, a taste, a flavor, and it's almost like they're helping you do that. This happens a lot when I'm working with Jennifer, where I'll ask a question and she'll say, they told me that you were going to ask that question. It's like they popped the question into my head, and I said it, but 
she's like, but it didn't, or she'll finish my sentence before I've even started it. It's like as if, because she's hearing what they're telling me to ask. Well, what are these council members like when they're assigned someone like a Jeffrey Dahmer? My God, what do, what do they do about that? Well, you you have to. The, it's so complicated, and I I try not. To, I didn't mean to chuckle there. It's a t- difficult topic because it, 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 but it comes up all the time, and so we have to sort of examine what is going on because, of course, we're talking about a theater. These are actors that are cast to play a role in a theater, and they've. Uh, the people that are in the theater are aware of it. We only bring a portion of our conscious energy to a lifetime. So there's part of our consciousness is always back home. So while we're here on stage, we're also off stage. The portion off stage is aware of all of our lifetimes, aware of why we're on stage, but the portion on stage is not aware because of the filters. So now you have a, a person, let's not use Jeffrey. Let's just say somebody who's, causing chaos and causing difficulty. We have our higher selves back home to ask, like, what's going on? What is this person doing here? Why did we agree to participate in their nonsense? Or did they go beyond what they were planning to do? Or were they so abused on the planet that they turned into an abuser, which is often the case? You know, did something toxic happen to their DNA while they were here that turned them into this kind of monster? And why would we, what lessons do we get from that? The weird part of this research is to discover that everybody that we sort of really dislike, a portion of them still exists, whatever that is. And we can access that and we can ask them questions and their guides and their council members. What's up with that? What were you guys thinking? Why did you allow this chaos to happen and they will answer those questions well how do they intervene though i mean how do you stop a jeffrey dahmer if you have to well i mean i mean if you're a council member if you're a council member uh, you know you'd have to think again why did they allow him to choose his lifetime that's the question and then they'll tell you well in a previous lifetime this happened to him this identical thing happened to him and so when we were talking to him about learning from abuse and he, how he wanted to come and experience abuse again, he wanted to learn these lessons, things got haywire. I don't know, really know his story so well that I could... He killed you know. 17 people. No, I know that, and I know what he did to him, and I know he's from Milwaukee, and I just I didn't watch the series. It's not my cup of tea. But that being said, you know, from Adolf Hitler on, we you know, the planet has always had players that are really out of control, and you, you ask yourself, well, why, why did they allow this person to be there on, in the stage at this time? Well, because we have free will, don't we? But we also learn lessons. We sign up to learn lessons. And it might be to learn lessons of, because nobody dies. Those 17 people still exist. They're, they're back home. They left the stage. And you can talk to them and say, what, why, did you, why did you choose this? Well, they may have left the stage too early, though. They left too early, exactly, or they were bumped off stage. But still, when they get home, they go, they'll, they can explain it because their, their higher conscious self understands why they agreed to all the parameters. So it's very difficult for me to say, well, I, I don't know these people, so I don't know why these things happen. However, we can ask them. You can actually, even a guided meditation, you sit down with somebody who was a peripheral player, let's say a cop who was involved, and you ask him to access his higher self and his counsel and his guides. And while you're doing that, you say, now what's up with this event that happened in his lifetime that was part of this journey? And they'll give insight into the education that was involved, the people that learned lessons, as difficult as that sounds, because there's no journey that doesn't include lessons. The book, of course, on the Divine Councils, where do people get it? They can find it anywhere that they're selling online books. Uh, right now it's exclusively at uh, that Amazon company, and eventually it'll be in worldwide and other places. Who selects the Divine Council for the individual? Uh, apparently it's our guides. And our teachers. Now, our guide is the first order of business. When we, after we... Our guide is not a a council member, or it is? It can be, but mostly 
you're not. So let's say, uh, let's start with me. So I, I'm, I've been created out of energetic uh, photons, let's say, and now I'm assigned to a guide. That guide has gone through all of his lifetimes, and his graduation gift was Richard. So now I don't have a council yet. It's just me and him. And he now maps out with me what I'm supposed to learn, what I'm going to learn, what like, I want to learn. Like Clarence was for George Bailey and It's a Wonderful Life. Exactly. His guardian angel. And then as council members will be assigned or brought forth to match that frequency or energy of the thing that I'm trying to learn. So in George Bailey's case, it was like how to, how to love yourself, how to, how to not, you know, how to cherish yourself so much that you would never jump off a bridge. So his guides might be people who are masters at that. They really understand that very well. How do we know that we're not hallucinating, Rich, when we're talking about divine council members? Well, George, that's a good question about life, isn't it? That's true. How do we know we aren't hallucinating on it every day? I mean, you think about how does information come into your head? You know, we have electrical signals, right? We see the world around us, and it all comes to us. What people say when they're... When they're talking about, and listen, the answer, that was a flippant answer, but the answer really is people saying the same things consistently. So, again, if I have 100 people and I have each one of them talk to a council member and I ask the identical questions and this person doesn't know what I'm going to ask or doesn't know the council member, never heard from them before, but they give the same answers, the same hallmarks, then we have something that we can discuss in terms of data. I've had many uh, trips to visit with Akashic Libraries. You've heard, you know, I'm sure you've had many people on your show talking about the Akashic Library. Sure. And it's, you know, it's fascinating. In this book, I have a librarian give us a tour of the library, and I have him talk about what each tome, what each volume, what each book. And in his case, he's showing this person a, like a ball of light. And inside that ball of light are fractals. And each of the fractals, these mathematical equivalents or constants, they refer to a person's lifetimes, many lifetimes. So that kind of information can't be coming from hallucination, you know, because, A, it makes a lot of sense. B, I've heard it consistently through other people who don't, aren't familiar with this stuff, you see. So it's almost like I'm speaking to people in a foreign language and they're saying the same things in their foreign language once I translate it. Amazing. So it's hard to parse that as you would think that people would have, you know, based on their belief system, if they are this religion or that religion, you'd think they would have some kind of a, um, architecture that has to do with that religion. But that's not what happens. What people report is the same architecture often contrary to what their belief system is, whether they were atheists or believers. What they're hearing from people on the flip side, let's just call it that, people that are not here, mm -hmm. is consistent and it's reproducible. And so then it just becomes data. And once it's consistent and reproducible, then we can sort of examine it in terms of, well, what does this mean for psychology? What does this mean for psychiatry? What does this mean for science? If we can ask people in a council, like, how do we fix climate change? Now, you would think that you'd get a million different answers, but you don't. You get these consistent answers. More trees means more oxygen means the temperature of the earth cools. That's consistent, even though the person I'm talking to has no clue what, what, what this means or why that would be important. But people on the flip side will tell you, uh, let's just say renewable resources. What's a great way to find energy out of natural resources? And I consistently hear that water itself has properties. And I've looked that up, and it turns out that salt water has uranium in it, but it's not the kind that's dangerous. But you have to, it like costs a lot of money to mine it out of there, but still. Water itself turns out to be a renewable source of energy, aside from the you know steam engine stuff. And my point is, look, I'm as you can even hear me talking about it, I'm not well-versed in the science of it or the mathematics of it. 
But let's get mathematicians, let's get physicists, let's get doctors talking to their councils to learn things about their councils. Do the councils have our best interests at heart? Great question, because, you know, people always ask, like, well, you must be talking to somebody negative out there. What they consistently say are positive things. They, I've never heard anybody saying anything. You know, I'll ask, how is, it's a simple question, how's our friend doing? How's George doing, I'll ask. And the answer, you would think there are three possible answers. He's doing great. He's not doing so great. He needs to work on stuff. I mean, that's generally what we would think a good answer would be. But what I hear consistently from people on the flip side, from council members, this sentence, he's on the right path. Now, it's not a sentence that you and I would use. I mean, we don't talk about paths so much, you know, unless we're mountaineers. But they'll say it consistently. Hmm. He's on the right path. And when you sort of examine what that means, they're talking about the path that you've chosen, that you're on the path that you chose to be on, and you're doing pretty much what you set out to do. So that's an unusual way to put that idea and how, well, how do you get something negative out of that? He's on the right path. You know what I mean? As I pointed out earlier, everybody has a certain amount of conscious energy that they bring to the planet. It's, there's a portion that's back home and there's a portion that's on stage. And when the portion on stage leaves the stage, 99% of them go home. But there's a percentage that say, I want to stick around for whatever reason. And, of course, we call them ghosts or we call them specters or whatever we call them. They're just people. They're just people who used to be on the planet. It has nothing to do whether they were good or bad. Everybody goes home. There's no library card to get home. You get to go home. Just before we started up in this segment, I was looking at a photograph of my friend Luana Andrews, who passed away some years ago and has been helpful to me and, like, inspired me in this work and flip side and everything. And the sentence I heard as I looked at her photograph was, talk about meditation. And you just brought it up. And I think it's an important thing to talk about meditation because, look, we, people have a bugaboo about different forms of meditation. And as we know, med means measure in Latin, literally measuring your thoughts. And there are so many different forms of meditation. You could ride a bike and be meditating. You can go swimming and be meditating. Also, you can count your breath in the morning to not think about stressful things other than just what's the next number for the next 10 minutes. You've heard of mindfulness training. That comes out of a study that shows that meditation can cure or alleviate depression in human beings. Richard Davidson, University of Wisconsin, showed that through science, that meditation can change the shape of the amygdala, the part of your brain that regulates serotonin. Doing a meditation, and the one he used, because I asked him about it, was called Tonglen, which is a Tibetan meditation, which is literally praying for the health of somebody else. Turns out that praying for the health of somebody else helps your health. So meditation is a fantastic field to delve into. In my case, this idea of just plucking a sentence, picture yourself in a boat on a river. It's just to show how simple it is that anyone can do it. You don't need to have a yoga instructor. You don't need to have a, t I mean, all these things help. Sure. Of course, it's important. You could have a medium. You could have a, you could have a teacher, a hypnotherapist help you, but you don't have to. You can just access this stuff by just calming your mind and opening your heart up to the possibility that your loved ones still exist. Rich, how did you come across the Divine Councils in the first place? Well, just to fin uh, uh, thank you for that question, George. Just to finish that thing with Holly, which is when she's talking to TJ, when she asks those series of questions, eventually she's going to get a thought or s uh, some kind of uh, answer before she can think of it. So when you, so the an the thing is just one: say their name. Two: ask them questions. Three: when you get an answer before you can ask the question, then you know you've made a connection. And to answer your question, the first time I came across councils in the afterlife was through Michael Newton. I had, uh -huh. you know, back in uh, the day, I decided I was going to make a documentary about his work. 
And um, I read that he was talking about these councils of elders. And I thought to myself, wow, that, you know, that sounds like something out of a cartoon. You know, you go into some room and there are these people in robes and they're telling you what to do and, you know, being judged. But then when I interviewed Paul Orend, who was the former president of the Newton Institute, he said, he describes, and I mentioned it in the book, he describes going into a council and, and them saying, no, no, nobody's judging you here. That's not what this is for. This is for you to examine your journey. So since then, I found it fascinating. And this book is really a compendium of all the councils that I've spoken to. And by the way, I'm here speaking on their behalf, because how else hmm. can I not pass along what they're telling me in this unusual way? You know, what are we talking about? We are energy, and when we ha we're light, you know, as human beings, right? We're light and we're energy, and when we bring a certain portion of our conscious energy to our life, it's possible for us on the flip side to, to let's say, use energy either to disrupt a conversation. I'm sure this has happened with George. When you talk about this stuff on the radio or you get interference, you get weird sort of uh, almost like the – generator seems to blow up while you're doing it. In the, in the film industry, I've also had that experience where I've filmed in places where quote-unquote energy is still there, ghosts, etc. And sure enough, you do find in certain, you know, the times that these things sort of blow up. But the point is asking questions. So what does, what do these people want to say? And by the way, my aunt, who was a very religious person, I was talking to her about this stuff way before this research, and she told me and no one else that her husband, when he passed away, appeared at the foot of her bed and looking healthy and young and said, I love you. And at that moment, the phone rang to say that he had passed away. It's their people. They've just left the stage. And because they're still connected to us, they can appear. It's not like they're an apparition. They're them. We just can't see them in complete detail the way they see each other on the flip side. So the idea is they still exist. They still exist today. Even if somebody passed away 20 years ago, 100 years ago, 5,000 years ago, they exist. And we can take the time to learn how to chat with them and ask them questions because they're outside of time when you're on the flip side. You see? So... You can access somebody that's, even if they've reincarnated, their higher self is always back home. Rich, once again, thank you for being on the program. Keep in touch with us, okay? We love you, George. Have a Rich, Rich Martini, Divine Counsels in the Afterlife. The Coast Mobile app is now available for download on iPhones and Android devices. You can become an insider directly through this app. This is a great option for our international listeners and new users will also receive a free two-week trial.